like, bro. Is he actually got a kid. Look at his back. Oh my god. <laughs> This is the Spanish Empire 104, Columbus and Magellan. Yeah. This is the first part of the Spanish Empire reaction. You know what I mean? Um, I did re I think I did a reaction to the channel before. It was a, how Russia conquered Siberia. That was part one. I'll have part two up soon for that. So that'll probably be looking at next, you know, group of reactions for you guys. So make sure you stick around for that. So if you're enjoying these type of videos, let me know down in the comments if you want to see these more historical videos, because I like watching these videos. So um, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and share. Let us know other videos that you can see down in the comments. Make sure you check out our other channel, 412 Show. We're going to have a video probably up. By the time I post this video, it's probably going to already be up. So go check out the 412 Show at LVB Gaming. We're going to have a new video up on that as well. And so, um, yeah, we're going to hop right in. I should be judged as a captain went from Spain to the Indies to conquer a people numerous and warlike, whose manners and religion are very different from ours, whom by divine will I have placed under the sovereignty of the king and queen. Another world, whereby Spain, which was reckoned poor, is become the richest of countries. It's 1492. Spain had just vanquished the last remnant of the Islamic Caliphate in Iberia. This long struggle lasted for almost eight centuries, and at the end the dominant power to emerge in Spain is Castile. Castile was an unlikely candidate for this at the start of the Reconquista. With its mediocre land and sparse population, Castile was poor and backward. Its people, however, were always ready for war. Feudalism never fully developed in Castile, and the only requirement for nobility was the willingness and ability to fight. With a large surplus of fighting men, the desire for more land and new subjects to lord over was constantly unquenched. First little by little, then by great leaps and bounds, the better part of Iberia had to submit to Castile. With the conquest of Seville, a rich trading hub connected to the sea by a navigable river, Castile became open to the vast ocean. Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabel of Castile ruled Spain as co-monarchs since 1469. Aragon, Ferdinand's domain, had a long seafaring tradition. However, its energy had mostly been spent on expansion in the Mediterranean and in Italy. Thus, the lion's share of building the Spanish Empire will fall on Castile. Its main rival in this is Portugal. Portugal had concluded its own Reconquista centuries ago, and thus could commence its naval expansion with a head start. Madeira was conquered in 1418, the Azores in 1432, and Cap Verde in 1462. The Gold Coast of Africa was reached by 1471. Spain in turn claimed the Canary Islands. <clears throat> Conflict over the island chain led to the War of the Castilian Succession in 1475. Spain won on land but lost to Portugal at sea. A compromise was reached in 1479. By the Treaty of Alcacobas, Spain could keep the Canaries, However, Portugal was granted exclusivity on all exploration south of Cape Bojador. This left Spain with only two avenues for expansion, southward and westward. Expansion into North Africa was attempted, but due to stiff resistance from the Moors, this proved to be impractical, leaving Spain with only one option. By the late 1480s, both Spain and Portugal are working hard to figure out an alternative route to India and the fabled Spice yeah, Islands, one that would there. bypass the Islamic realm. If either kingdom could best the other and reach India first, they would have access to boundless riches and endless opportunities. Exotic spices, silks and porcelain would be imported by the shiploads and distributed all over Christendom. The stakes are very high indeed. There are two theories on how to reach India. Both theories accept that the world is round. The first claims that west of Europe there is a chain of islands corresponding to Atlantis. Sailing past these, one would reach India. The other theory states that the world is far smaller than the first school of thought believes, and thus if one sails far enough west, one is bound to reach Japan or China. Once this is achieved, hmm. India would be just a short right Christopher Columbus, the son of a Genoese weaver, is a firm believer in the latter theory. In spite of his pedigree, Columbus has considerable experience as a sailor and as a keen student of cartography. During his journeys, he sailed to the coast of Ionia, to Iceland, and even to Africa on a Portuguese ship. 
Columbus first tried to sell his scheme of reaching Asia by a westerly route to the King of Portugal. John II, however, is convinced that the shortest way to reach India is by sailing around Africa. With no luck in Portugal, Columbus heads to Spain in 1486. The Catholic monarchs, especially Isabella, are interested in the idea, but Columbus has to wait until the conquest of Granada is concluded. His insistence that he gets a hereditary governorship and a share of the royal revenue in the lands he discovers only makes things harder. But with powerful backers at court and the work concluded, Columbus finally gets a royal commission in 1492. He sets out from Palos on the 3rd of August 1492 with three small ships and 89 men. Six days later, he reaches the Canaries and departs from there on the 6th of September. Land is sighted on the 12th of October. Columbus first lands in the Bahamas and from there he proceeds to discover Cuba and the island that will be known as Hispaniola. Can you imagine being a part of that and like you're conquering a new land and you're finding new regions of the planet that have never been explored? Well, it's been explored by humans already, just people living there, but I mean by a new group of people that have no idea that this whole landmass is just right there across the ocean. Like, it has always been a whole different feeling and then the fact that they had such a technological difference that they didn't, like they were pretty much able to just do as they what they wanted. I mean, like, what kind of thoughts would have been going through your head at that point? Like, could you have been like, dang, like I can really become like the richest among I mean my peers once I go back home from able to get the like because. But once they reached Mexico and stuff like that, like they were able to get like so much gold and stuff from the Mayans, and then they get I said the Mayans from the Aztecs, and then lastly once they conquered the Inca, that's when they got a lot of gold. Like they filled a room up to the roof with gold. Like just like just he was just saying, I'll have a roof filled. I have this room filled with gold if you let me go, something like that. And he did it. I don't think he even let him go. I think he killed him actually. So yeah. It was it's wild to think like how much they were able to do, especially back then, like how that felt. But I mean, you can still get, you can still have that feeling now. Like at this point nowadays, we're looking toward the stars. Like we already conquered the planet. Now we just have to, you know, focus on ourselves as a species and necessarily think of what's going to benefit us for the future. So you know, that's it. Turn looking out for towards the stars, maybe colonize the moon, and then start colonizing our galaxy. Our solar system first, you know, then our galaxy and stuff like that. But yeah, we're gonna hop right back into the video. I'm gonna throw them off. He finds there the Taino people who use Stone Age technology and practice subsistence agriculture. He christens them Indians, since he's firmly convinced that he landed in Asia, most likely in China or Japan. Columbus finds the Taino to be timid and excessively peaceful. He trades European goods for a few trinkets of gold, being fully satisfied that he proved the concept that riches can be found in this new land. While there, Columbus loses one ship and so has to leave behind 39 men on Hispaniola. He sets sail to Spain on the 15th of January 1493, taking a northerly route by way of the Azores, reaching land in Portugal and heading from there to Spain. Columbus is welcomed at court as a hero and tells of his discovery of Asia. The monarchs are fascinated by the foreign trinkets of gold and their imaginations run wild as Columbus tells them tall tales of endless riches that these foreshadow. To protect their interests, the monarchs send Columbus back with a much larger fleet of 17 ships and 1200 men in September. They also take steps on the diplomatic front. With the help of the Pope, a fellow Spaniard, they bring about the Treaty of Tordesillas. The treaty divides the seas between Spain and Portugal, with Spain claiming all new discoveries west of the line, while Portugal claims the ones to the east of it. This is an easy concession for Portugal to make, as they already know the route to Asia, while Columbus is still just speculating about one. Nonetheless, the colonization of the New World is already underway, but nothing goes as the monarchs had intended. The 1200 Spanish settlers are only interested in getting gold, and they all want it now. They fall upon the exactly, peaceful Indians, saying, spoiling like, them of all their new possessions, killing and point. enslaving many. Priests who came along are appalled by this, <clears throat> while the settlers insist that Columbus is not doing enough. Hispaniola is colonized on the model that was used in the Canaries. Encomiendas or commissions are granted to the settlers, whereby an Indian village is compelled to do labor in the service of the encomendero, a hybrid system between serfdom and slavery. But even this is not enough. 
Soon the Spanish start fighting amongst themselves. Many return to Spain disillusioned and file sharp complaints against Columbus. Columbus himself, who is essentially a navigator and a mariner, is completely overwhelmed by the situation. He discovers two more islands, Jamaica and Puerto Rico, but has little more to show than what he found on the first voyage. By this time, it's quite evident that Columbus did not find Asia. Ferdinand and Isabella no longer wine and dine in, however he is still interested with leading a further expedition. The purpose of this is to establish whether the New World is a large continent or just a group of islands. This is very important, since the new discoveries are now seen as a potential springboard to Asia. In 1498, Columbus discovers the Orinoco River, concluding that there is indeed a continent there. After this, he returns to Hispaniola. While he was gone, Santo Domingo, the first settlement to survive, had been established by his brother, whom Columbus left in charge. The problems, however, had not abated, and more and more complaints are lodged against Columbus. Ferdinand and Isabella finally have enough and order his arrest. His replacement arrives in 1499, and Columbus is sent back in chains. When he arrives, the monarchs pardon him and even allow him a well, fourth French exploration. However, true. Columbus is not received as governor. During this fourth voyage, Columbus charts the coast of Central America, bringing back valuable information about another ocean and the rich kingdom to the west. This, however, is the Admiral's last voyage. He retires to Spain and dies of gout in 1506. Gout. But this, of course, is not the end, but rather the beginning of exploration. Vicente and Espinzon, one of Columbus's partners, discovers the Amazon River in 1499. In 1501, Rodrigo de Bastidas, who arrived with the second fleet, discovers the Gulf of Uraba and Panama. Alonso de Oeda, who likewise arrived with the second fleet, explores the coast of Venezuela and attempts to establish a first settlement there. Amerigo Vespucci, a fellow explorer, writes about his adventures and instantly becomes a bestseller. The name America soon enters into public consciousness. Mm. These explorations are okay, facilitated see, by see, the new vice natives, Nicolas de Ovando. In 1502, Ovando arrives with 30 ships and 2,500 men. He pacifies the Indians who have become warlike due to their mistreatment and also ends the conflict between the settlers. Hispaniola becomes moderately prosperous, with an economy based on sugar plantations, cattle and pigs. There is, however, very little gold, and most of the Indians die out due to the constant conflict. The solution to this problem is to colonize the other islands. Puerto Rico is conquered in 1508, Jamaica in 1509, followed by Cuba in 1511. In the same year, Diego so Columbus, the explorer's really son, regains his hereditary land. right to govern, as for the so conflict his father had made with the monarchs. Columbus Jr., however, proves to be unpopular especially with Diego Velázquez, the conqueror of Cuba. Velázquez thinks up a clever scheme to get rid of Columbus. He calls up a general council that is filled by his loyalists, who in turn elect him as the governor of Cuba and authorize him to deal directly with Spain, thus bypassing Columbus's authority. Since Velázquez has powerful friends at court, this semi-legal shenanigan is allowed. Little does Velázquez know that this same legal maneuver will be used against him at some point. Nevertheless, thanks to his able and often brutal leadership, Cuba is fast becoming the center of the Spanish Empire in the Caribbean. The Caribbean, however, was not enough. Following the explorations of the mainland, Spain decided to establish two colonies on the continent. Nueva Andalusia on the east side of the Gulf of Uraba and Veragua on the west side. Mm. Nueva Andalusia is to be led by Alonso de Ojeda, the explorer of Venezuela. Ojeda establishes a settlement, however this soon fails. One of the settlers there is Vasco Núñez de Balboa, a young and ambitious adventurer, who previously took part in Bastidas' explorations. Armed with this knowledge, Balboa manages to convince the rest of the settlers to pack up and move to the neighboring colony of Veragua. Here, Balboa and his men defeat an Indian chief and found a successful colony at Darien. Meanwhile, the rightful ruler of Veragua, Diego de Nicueza, a nobleman of few abilities, is also trying to start a settlement further north. This settlement is defeated by Indians, and when Nicueza hears of Balboa's illegal colony, he quickly moves to take it over. Balboa, however, is one step ahead. Using the same legal trick Velasquez had used, he elects himself governor with the help of his cronies. Nicueza is denied entry to his rightful domain and is never seen again. Balboa won, however, he is living on borrowed time. 
Unlike Velasquez, Balboa doesn't have powerful friends at court who might overlook this illegality. Therefore, he has no other choice but to prove himself. He starts by expanding the colony of Daria, partly by violence and partly by diplomacy. The grand prize, however, lies on the other side of this isthmus. The Spanish had known for years that there is a vast ocean across the continent that beyond any doubt would lead to Asia. Surely, if Balboa could find a way to this ocean, he will gain such favor that his previous crimes will be overlooked. Thus, in 1513, Balboa sets out with 190 men, and after a grueling trek across the mountains and the jungles, he discovers the Pacific Ocean. As soon as he gets back to Darien, word is sent to Spain to announce his discovery. Balboa's plan kind of works, and it doesn't. In 1514, Pedrarias Davila, an old nobleman of mean repute, is sent to take charge. Balboa's crimes are overlooked by Spain, however, he has to content himself with being second in command. This is the worst position to be, owing to Pedrarias' extreme jealousy and paranoid nature. Pedrarias soon allies with Balboa's old enemies, and after a kangaroo court proceeding where the judge and jury are his acolytes, Balboa is condemned to die. After this, Pedrarias starts to expand his colony, subjugating Indians left and right. He moves the capital to Panama, and by the 1520s the colony begins to flourish. While all this was going on, the Portuguese were already in India, expanding their possessions and making big bucks importing oriental spices. In 1511, Alfonso de Albuquerque conquers Malacca, establishing the Portuguese right Italy next to the fabled spice islands. One of Albuquerque's men was the Portuguese navigator Ferdinand Magellan. After the Malacca campaign, Magellan heads back to Portugal. Here he devises a daring plan. He claims that the Spice Islands can be reached by sailing west, circumnavigating America. He proposes his idea to the Portuguese court, however King Manuel sees no use for this second route, since he already controls the eastward way to Asia. Not finding any favor with the Portuguese, Magellan heads to Spain. Charles V, the young Habsburg Emperor, is much more open to Magellan's plan. According to some theories and estimations, the Moluccas and the Spice Islands might just lie within Spain's sphere of influence, as per the Treaty of Tordesillas. To claim these perceived rights, Charles needs to act quickly. The colony in Panama is still in an embryonic state and doesn't have the infrastructure to launch an expedition from there. This leaves Magellan as the only possibility to get to the Spice Islands quickly. In September 1519, Magellan departs with five ships and 270 men. He heads to South America via the Canaries, reaching Brazil in December. He spends some time exploring the vast estuary of the River Plate and from there heads south. In October of 1520, he finds and navigates the straits that will later bear his name. From there he heads northwest, reaching the Philippines in March. Magellan claims the islands for Spain and promptly starts converting locals to Christianity. He achieves some success, however, one tribe of natives proves particularly hostile. When Magellan and his crew try to impose their will by force, the captain and over half of his crew are killed. After this, Magellan's second, Juan Sebastián Elcano, takes command and tries to salvage what he can. The fleet immediately sets sail to Europe, heading directly to the Cape of Good Hope, and then north to the Canaries, avoiding Portuguese bases the best they can. By the time they reach Europe, only one ship remains out of five, and 19 men out of 207. Nonetheless, the first circumnavigation of the globe was complete in 1522, oh, wow. a feat that would only be repeated Autumn 15 years later. 19 left. As it turned out, only the Philippines fell They're within Spain's heroes. However, this was more than enough for Spain to gain a foothold in Asia. Jesus Christ. Long story, and then we get into the port where he started, they started conquering Mexico, and they started conquering it, um, you know, it's uh, necessarily farther than Venezuela. And then you got like um, Ecuador and all that other stuff. But yeah, the Inca. Once they hit the Inca, that's when they hit like a huge quantity of gold and stuff. Um, you see the Portuguese, they colonized Brazil. Cause it, it fits along the line of the border that the Pope had read. Yeah, man. Let me know if you want to see more of these historical uh, videos down in the comments. I like watching these. You know, I do. I enjoy them. Hit that like button, subscribe, and share. We're the 10K. We'll see you next time. Peace. Hello.